Thank you very much. Great to be with you. I tell you what, on the way back from Hazelnut, it was lashing down with rain. But actually, once we got down the bottom of Hamilton Road, it eased a bit. So, yeah, interesting, isn't it? So, as Andy said, I'm going to be continuing our series, Breathe In, Breathe Out, and the Rhythm of Prayer is going to be my subject. And I'm going to base it around one verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is comparing the Old Testament, the Old Covenant under Moses, with the New Covenant under Christ. And uh, as he does that, in verse 18, which is the verse I want to focus on, he's kind of summing it up a bit. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says this, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, as Andy said, there's lots of ways that, that you can get connected here at King's. And one of the things that we run is a course called Chapter One. In Chapter One, we try and encourage people to develop good rhythms in their Christian discipleship. And I've been doing it this term, and... Last week we were talking, or no, it was this, yeah, last week, last Thursday, we were talking about uh, Scripture, the rhythm of Scripture. And so we're looking at the Bible, and you get a booklet that goes with it, and there are readings that you can do every day, very helpful. And so this coming week, we're going to be looking at the rhythm of prayer. So I was looking through the booklet and listening to some of the audios that there are there, and one of the things I read was right at the introduction of this section on prayer, it says this, let's be honest, prayer can be a struggle. We sit down to pray with all good intentions, but our minds wander to the to-do list. We get the words out, but they just sound wooden or mechanical, or it just feels like we're talking to thin air. Far from being devoted to prayer, many people go through life with a low-level guilt that they don't pray often enough and don't pray well enough. I wonder if some of that echoes with you. It certainly did with me when I read it, but I don't want to look at this area, the rhythm of prayer, as something that we're failing at, as I don't think that's very helpful. I don't want, when I finish, for you to think, oh dear, I'm failing. No, no. What I want to do is I want to try and build on some of the things you may already be doing and perhaps not even realizing that you are. Now, I thought about this because John asked me to focus on contemplative prayer, stillness, silence. Well, I have to say my immediate reaction was I'm not very good at that. I'm pretty good at asking. In fact, asking I find quite easy. And indeed, we are encouraged to do that. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. And maybe you hear the words a bit like me, contemplative prayer, and you think of a monastery or Christian retreat Maybe like me, you're the kind of person who's energized more by others than by being silent and reflective. But I guess, having said all that, it's like many things in life, isn't it? The more you practice, the easier it gets. And we've been hearing recently, last few weeks, about stopping. Now, I'm pretty sure that two weeks ago at Hazemir, John actually said, just stop at one point. And when he was speaking, just stop. And I heard that. I think, hmm. And then in her 10 talk, Nicola Wade, uh, a couple of weeks ago again, when when Nicola was speaking, she was talking from Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. You might say, I find that really hard. You don't know the pressures I'm under. I'm under so much pressure. I'm so busy. Well, I was thinking about this and I was reminded of the story of Elijah in the Old Testament. And now Elijah He was a great prophet, but when he was uh, living in Israel at the time, there was a wicked king and queen, and they had their own prophets of this pagan god called Baal. And Elijah confronted them one day, and he took them to a mountaintop, and he said, okay, we'll have a sacrifice. You call, you prophets of Baal, call on your god, and ask him to bring fire down on the sacrifice, and then I'll call on the Lord God, and whoever brings the fire down, he is God. Do you agree? They said, yeah, we agree. So the prophets of Baal dance around the sacrifice. They cut themselves, and they shout, and Elijah mocks them while they're doing that, and uh, they call on their God, Baal, to bring fire down, and nothing happens. 
And then Elijah pours water on the sacrifice and he calls on the Lord God and fire comes down. Wow. And then he gets all the prophets of Baal who are wicked and lead the people astray, annihilated. And then, because there's been a drought for three years, a bit like in Australia recently, although they have had some rain, Elijah gets down on his knees and prays for the drought to end after three years. And lo and behold, he prays seven times and looks, and the rain comes down. And it comes down so much, a bit like I saw when I came down Hamilton Road, that he says to King Ahab, get in your chariot and off you go to Jezreel because the storm is coming. And then what happens is this, that Elijah himself runs faster than the chariot, not because he's wearing Nike's bespoke Alpha Fly trainers, but because he's empowered by the Spirit. And he gets back to the city. And can you imagine the high he must have been on? He's seen the prophets of Baal defeated. He's seen the drought broken. He's run empowered by the Spirit, outran the chariot, pulled by horses. Amazing. He gets to the city, and then the wicked queen Jezebel, when she hears all about it, she says, well, death to you, Elijah. I'm out to get you. And that was no empty threat that she made. And this was Elijah's reaction. In 1 Kings 19, verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Talk about pressure. He ends up in a cave on his own. And it's there that the Lord speaks to him. Not in a great and powerful wind that we've been hearing swirling around us today. Not in an earthquake. Not in a fire. But in a gentle whisper. In this place of solitude, on his own, when he's under immense pressure, when he feels that he alone is following the Lord, the Lord speaks to him. I wonder if you sometimes feel under enormous pressure. I wonder if you sometimes feel you're facing things on your own. There was a friend of mine who also was under enormous pressure. Not in this country. It was another country uh, that I have been to, and uh, he was facing also some real death threats, serious death threats, and sadly, those people who should have stood by him at that time, they didn't, and, you know, it made him possibly feel even more alone, so what did he do? Well, this is what he did. He went off by himself into a garden And he prayed. And from that, he gained strength for what he was about to go through. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus. (laughs) Prayer is essential in life as it connects us to our Heavenly Father. And I just don't want to read about him, although I do. I don't just want to hear about him, although I do. I want to experience him. I want to experience the Lord. How about you? I guess you're here today because in the end, you want to experience the Lord. You want to experience the reality of God. You want, if possible, to meet with him. Or maybe you're, you're seeking and you're not sure. You'd like to understand what we can get so excited about. Whatever stage you're at, whether you have had experiences of God or not, I believe you're not here by chance, but you're here by divine appointment. And it may be that even before the foundation of the world, God determined that you would be here at this particular Sunday morning on the 9th of February to hear this message. You're not here by chance, but you're here by divine purpose. Now, I could tell you some of the things that I believe. For example, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You might ask me, do you believe that? I would unhesitatingly answer, yes, of course I believe that. To use the technical term, it's my doctrinal conviction. And that's fine, but for me it's not enough. I also want to experience God for myself. So if, as the Bible says, God is love... I don't just want to read it, although that's helpful. I don't just want to hear it, although that's helpful. I want to experience the reality that God is love. I want to know it for myself. I want to know it up close and personal that I am loved by God. I want to experience his love. How about you? If the Bible says 
that we can approach God's throne with confidence because of what Jesus has done. I want to not just read it, although that's helpful, not just hear it, although that's helpful. I want to experience it. I want to be able to do it. I want to be able to approach God's throne with confidence and assurance, knowing that I'm loved by him. Tim Keller, the Christian writer and pastor, puts it like this. We must be able to existentially access our doctrinal convictions. In other words, what we believe, we must experience it too. Let me give you an example. I could say to you, and you'd probably agree with me, the Taj Mahal is a beautiful building. I could tell you some truths about it. Some you might know, some you might not. I could tell you it's in India, you probably knew that. I could tell you it's in the city of Agra. I could tell you it was built in the 17th century. I could tell you it took about 30 years to build. I could tell you it was built by Shah Jahan in memorial to his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. I could tell you that in 1983, UNESCO designated it a World Heritage Site. Why? Because they said it was the jewel of Muslim art in India and one of the universally admired masterpieces of the world's heritage. I could tell you all those things, but it's quite another thing to go there and see the sunrise on its marble dome. It's quite another thing to go there and touch the stone. It's quite another thing to go there and go up the steps into the mausoleum. It's quite another thing to go there and sit on Diana's bench. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, <clears throat> I've always loved this verse. I've always liked that notion of contemplating the Lord's glory and so being transformed into his image. You know, I know I need to change. I want to change. I know I have got character defects. I know I can be impatient. I know I can say the wrong thing at the wrong time. I know that I can fail to do some of the good things that maybe the Spirit's nudging me to do and I don't do them. So I know that I need to be transformed. Now, I love the way that we can be transformed that the Apostle Paul is describing here. What he's not saying is this. He's not saying, okay, focus on that which is wrong in your life. And then make yourself a spiritual New Year resolution to determine to be better than you were yesterday. He's not saying that. He's saying, no, we all with unveiled face, contemplating the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness. Well, do you want to be transformed into his likeness? You're not sure. Hello. Of course you do. I want to be transformed into his likeness. I want to be more compassionate than I am now. I want to be more kinder than I am now, more loving than I am now. I want to speak words that build people up more than I do now, as Jesus did. <coughs> I want to be transformed to become like him. <coughs> and the Apostle Paul is giving us a different approach. <coughs> so he says, with unveiled faces. Well, what's that about? In Exodus chapter 34, when Moses met with God, his face became radiant. But the people couldn't cope with it. I think they were afraid. Moses goes up the mountain, he disappears for a little while, he comes back down the mountain, and his face is glowing. It's radiant. Wow, they're scared by this. No, we can't, they can't cope with it for some reason. And so he covers his face with a veil. And then when he goes in to meet with the Lord, he removes the veil again. But the Apostle Paul is saying, no, we don't have to live like that. We all, by the way, did you notice? We all, with unveiled faces, all includes everybody here right now. God has no favorites. We're all on an equal footing. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. We're all those who our sins are forgiven through Jesus' sacrifice. We've all started on a level playing field. We're all equal in that sense. So no favorites. So we all, so don't exclude yourself. Don't say, yeah, well, it's okay for you, Ron. You're up on the stage. You're an elder. Da, da, da. No, no, no. We're all, we all with unveiled face. 
contemplate the Lord's glory. So Moses, he's saying we don't have to have a, a veiled face. And we read as well when Jesus died that the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the rest of it was torn from top to bottom because it signified that the way into God's very holy presence was made possible by what Jesus had done. So we all, please don't exclude yourself. If you're excluding yourself, then you're believing a lie. We have access into God's presence anytime, any place, at work, on the train, in the classroom, driving the car, in bed, out for a walk, shopping, at church, bathing the children. Right here, right now, we have access fully because of what Jesus has done. So we have amazing opportunities to meet with the Lord, to experience him because of what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection. He's the living God. He's not dead. He acts. The acts of the apostles should really be called the acts of the Lord through the apostles. He speaks. He listens. He sees. As reading through the Bible in one year that we're doing at the moment, some of us are doing reading through Genesis recently, and there's that incident where Hagar gets cast out of Abraham and Sarah's house, and she's wandering around, and she feels alone, but the Lord, and she's very sad, understandably, and the Lord meets with her and speaks to her, and she says this, you are the God who sees me. I love that. You're the God who sees me. God sees us. So I want us to think of prayer in terms of breathing in. It's about breathing in the presence of God, having communion with Christ, spending time with a friend, getting to know him better. Friendships take time. We find ourselves saying to friends, as I have done on many occasions, maybe you've got friends in the neighborhood where you live or you see somebody in town and you're chatting with them and you say, oh, we must catch up. You must come round. It'd be lovely if you could could come round for, or we could go out for a coffee. And then time goes by and nothing happens. And I felt strangely convicted about that recently when we went to some friend's house. We just popped round to see them very briefly. And I said, we must catch up. And as I said, I thought I was saying this before Christmas. We must catch up. And so I said, okay, let's get our diaries out. Let's be intentional And make time for you to come round. And so we did. We organized a time for them to come round. 15th of April as it, uh, not April, 15th of February as it happens. The point is this. We need to be intentional. We're talking about rhythm of prayer. We need to be intentional. If I say to the Lord, oh, I must catch up. It won't happen. I must be intentional. And part of my rhythm of prayer is now on Thursday mornings come down to the meeting in the West End Hall, and I can give focused attention to the Lord. And the other Thursday, I came down to the meeting, and there was prayer going on, and I was just sort of quietly minding my own business in the corner somewhere, and I felt the Lord spoke to me. And I felt the Lord said one word, which I'll tell you in a minute. It made me think of the power of words as well, and how, you know, during the American Civil War, there was a terrible battle at Gettysburg, And after the war, they decided they would dedicate part of the land to those who lost their lives at that battle. And so what they decided to do was they decided to invite the greatest American orator of the time, the greatest American speaker, to come and speak at the dedication of this plot of ground. So the man's name was Edward Everett. So he came and he spoke extremely eloquently for two hours, very impressed. Then after him, President uh, Abraham Lincoln came and he spoke, and he spoke for about two minutes. Nobody, I think, remembers what Edward Everett said. But they do remember, especially in the States, what uh, Abraham Lincoln said. Let me quote you some, it might be familiar to you. Government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. That was his concluding words. Well, What's that got to do with me and what's that got to do with prayer? Well, the Lord spoke one word to me at that prayer meeting a couple of Thursdays ago. And one word from the Lord can speak volumes. And this was the word that the Lord spoke. Can you read it? Yeah, good. I'm glad that a lot of you have been to Specsavers because in the first meeting somebody said Jerusalem. So yeah, you're right. Well done. 
Uh, you're on a par with Hazel, but it says Jeshurun. Jeshurun. And the Lord spoke this word to me, Jeshurun. Just out of the blue, Jeshurun, he said. And I was really thrilled because I knew it was something good. And I knew that it was in Isaiah somewhere. It's somewhere else too. But I knew for sure it was in Isaiah. And I knew it was something that the Lord said about his people. And I knew it was something good. So I looked it up and in Isaiah 44 verse 2 it says this. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. So I got my commentaries out and was researching what the meaning of Jeshurun was. And, uh, well, it's certainly this. It's a term of affirmation. It's a term, really, that a father uses to a son. A dad uses to... It's, some of the commentators say it's an affectionate diminutive. I was talking to somebody this morning, and uh, I said to them, oh, what's, what's your boy's name? He said, Samuel. He said, but we call him Sampa. So it's that kind of idea of a, a term of affection that is given. It's, in other words, it's a term of endearment. And two weeks later, I'm still thinking about it. Just through that time of being intentional in prayer, and the Lord met with me, and I experienced something of his love afresh as he just said one word, Jeshurun, to me personally. In what way could you be intentional? Are you a morning person? Maybe you like to get up in the morning and you just like to sit with a coffee and just have a quiet time of thinking and just quiet prayer. If that's you, that's fantastic, but we're not all like that. I'm not like that usually. Or you are maybe your evening person, the kids have gone to bed, you know, it's seven, eight o'clock, I don't know, and, and that's for you is a good time. Or maybe you're not the kind of person who likes to sit for any length of time. I'm not so good, I'm learning, but I'm not so good at just sitting. Just sitting and being still. I'm not very good at that. I have to be still by walking. Sounds a contradiction, doesn't it? But that's what works for me. Or maybe you like something to focus on. Just to, you know, keep your mind from being distracted. If you do, could I suggest a great way is to just get a scripture out. Now, if you've been following the Lord for any length of time, I'm sure there are scriptures that you know, from time to time, they just come to the surface, or you think about them from time to time, and, or that's really spoken to you, or, you know, I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, that speaks to me, and I think about it a lot, you know, before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know all together, you know, these kind of things that percolate within me, that I know that, and I think about them. Maybe for you, that's a good way in which you could just spend that time, but be intentional, and obviously as well, take some time. The Apostle Paul uses the word to contemplate. You might say, I'm not very good at that. That's okay. You might be better than you realize. Now, before I show you a picture, I want to give you some background as to how I came about seeing this picture. About 30 years ago, when I was teaching, I went on a course to the National Gallery and it was a 3D course. It was fantastic. And one of the things I got to do was I got to speak with the director of the gallery himself. And that was quite amazing. And that he should speak with me. Fantastic. And then the curators did a presentation on a painting that they were thinking of buying. And at that time, 30 years ago, it was going to be a quarter of a million pounds. It's probably worth a lot more then. But it was a lot of money then. A quarter of a million for this painting. The only thing was there was an art gallery in Germany. And they said, we have got the original and he only did one, the artist. So the National Gallery thought, well, we're not convinced about that, so we're going to research our painting and just see before we, uh, we buy it. So what they did was, they, you know, you might have watched Fake or Fortune on the TV, and they take a little bit of paint off, and they examine it through a microscope, and they compare it with what the kind of paint that the artist used on his other canvases, and that matched up. In addition to that, they also used an infrared reflectogram on the painting so they could see if there was anything on the canvas underneath the paint. And there sure was. There was a drawing of a bridge. And uh, so they thought, aha, interesting. I wonder if the artist in his sketchbook has got anything like that. So they looked through the artist's sketchbook and lo and behold, 
the bridges in the sketchbook and then the painting completely matched up. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the National Gallery decided that they had the original painting, so they bought it. As a result of that, as I was listening to that, I thought I must go and look at the painting. So I found out where it was, went downstairs into the gallery, and this is what it looked like. And I want to ask you some questions as you look at this painting. I hope you can see it a bit clearer than at 9.30, yeah. So, there's grass growing through the snow, do you see? Is that significant? Is it symbolic? There's a building in the background. What is it? Why is it in the mist? Does it signify anything? I don't know if you can see it, but in front of the the building there's a bridge. If I had a pointer, I could, but I haven't, so. When they take my word, there's a bridge. Does that have any significance? The man, if you notice, has thrown away his crutches. Why? Wonder why? Why? What's the point of that? The trees, in their shape, tend to mimic the building. These evergreen trees, is that significant, I wonder? The man is lying against a rock and he's praying. Wonder what? So what I've just got you to do, hopefully, is I've got you to contemplate, to think about to give focused attention to. Well, we know a far greater story that we can focus on. We have a far greater story that we can contemplate. Thank you, Des, by the way. It's the story of the eternal God who is the maker of heaven and earth. It's the story of the one who was there in the beginning. It's the story of the one who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. It's a story of the one who becomes a baby, wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. It's a story of the one who grows in favor with both God and man. It's a story of the one who miraculously turns water into wine and feeds multitudes with a few loaves and fishes. It's a story of the one who wraps his arms around children and rebukes the religious elite. It's a story of the one who walks on water and washes feet. It's the story of the one who forgives the sinners and frees the demon possessed. It's the story of the one who restores health to the sick and raises the dead. It's the story of the one who teaches the truth and tames the raging sea. It's the story of the one who, as we see, was made a little lower than the angels, hanging on a cross, with all his bones out of joint, abandoned, forsaken, his blood flowing from his hands, his feet, his side. It's the story of the one who cries out, It is finished. It's a story of mercy and forgiveness to a rebellious people. It's a story of his triumph over death as he is raised to life and ascends to heaven. It's a story of him sending the promised Holy Spirit to be with us, to be in us, to be in you and me, so that we can, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. How good is that? How amazing is our God, who has gone through all that trouble from the heights of heaven itself to come to planet Earth, to be raised to life, to be seen seated on high, to send the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to be you and me, to be inside you and me, so that we might be able to contemplate with an unveiled face the glory of the Lord and be transformed from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit who is at work within us. How amazing is that? I don't just want to read. I don't just want to hear. I want to experience the might of the living God. I want to experience something of his glory. How about you? You're going to have to take time to do it. You're going to have to be intentional to do it. Our Heavenly Father, our precious Heavenly Father loves us with an undying love. And he longs to wrap his heavenly arms around you. He longs for you to hear the word Jeshurun for yourself. 
My sheep know my name and, I, and they follow me. They hear my voice. Our God is great and we can behold him with an unveiled face. We can be transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Don't be frightened of the idea of contemplation. I know I can be because we all do it anyway. We've just done it. We've contemplated he did that pick. We can contemplate the Lord's glory. As we draw near to the Lord, he will speak with us. And we'll experience something of the reality of who he is. Be deliberate. Be intentional. Find out what works for you. Finally, I just want to ponder this scripture. Again, like I was saying, I'll just, you know, get some scriptures, ponder them. It can be really helpful. This is one that I love and ponder a lot. Just want to ponder this scripture in the light of what Jesus has done for you and me. And here it is. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what am I that you are mindful of me? Of me, a mere human, that you care for me. You can see I've changed the words there, personalized, that you can too. When I consider your heavens, oh God. Wow. God is so great, he's so good, and yet he loves each and every one of us. I want to thank you, Lord, for your love. I want to thank you that you want to draw us to yourself. Help us to take that time, Lord, to meet with you. Help us to just contemplate, even for a few minutes, as we're doing right now, (laughs) who you are and your glory. And thank you, Jesus, you long to meet with us. And thank you that you want to uh, speak with us. You want to strengthen us and you want to encourage us. You're lovely, Lord. You're beautiful. Thank you that we are in this together as your people. Thank you that you've drawn us together. And we can encourage one another in this. We praise you, Lord. We praise you for your amazing love. May we today, Lord, all be transformed with ever-increasing glory. By the Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.